Like you said, my name is Stephanie Schmidt. I'm the Whooping Crane Outreach Coordinator at the International Crane Foundation. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the cranes that we have here in the Midwest. I'm gonna keep my mask on just for this, just for COVID precautions. But uh, for this program, we're gonna talk about the cranes we have in the Midwest. So I'll introduce the International Crane Foundation. We'll talk about who we are. I'll introduce you to all 15 species of cranes. Then I'll really focus in on the two cranes we have here in the Midwest, the Whooping Crane and the Sandhill Crane. I'll give you guys some tips, tricks, and pointers for identifying these birds out in the wild. I'll talk about their history and some of the spaces that they live. And I'll really focus in on the whooping crane reintroduction program that's happening here in our own backyard. And then hopefully by the end of the program, you'll give a whoop about whooping cranes just like we do. All right, so everyone can see my next slide. We're still going smoothly. Good. So the International Crane Foundation, also called ICF, works worldwide to conserve cranes in the ecosystems, watersheds, and flyways on which they depend. The International Crane Foundation is headquartered in Baraboo, Wisconsin. It is located within the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people. And as an organization, we acknowledge and honor the Ho-Chunk people as caretakers of the land and water since time immemorial, and as our neighbors, friends, and vital members of our community. The International Crane Foundation is dedicated to amplifying local voice and perspective in all the places where cranes dance. So pictured here, we have all 15 species of cranes. And you can see that all 15 species of cranes, they share some very similar features. They all appear to have very long beaks, small heads and long necks. And with these sorts of lengthening features, we can probably gather that these birds are relatively tall as well. And you can see that too from, if you're in person, I have some banners here where you can see a life-size whooping crane and then an almost life-size sandhill crane next to it as well. So the tallest of all 15 species of cranes is the Saurus crane, which is found in India and Australia. It stands at six feet tall. And the shortest of all 15 species is the Demoiselle crane, it stands at just about two and a half to three feet tall. But despite being the shortest uh, of the crane species, it does have the most impressive migration and the Demoiselle crane will migrate over the Himalayas. You can also see with the cranes, there's kind of a repetition of color between all of them. They all appear to have some sort of combination of black, white, red, and gray. All of them, that is, except for the blue crane, which is also called the Stanley crane. Instead, it has kind of a bluish gray throughout its head and body. And the blue crane is actually the national crane of South Africa. So cranes can be found around the world. You can find them on all but two continents. Cranes are found everywhere except South America and Antarctica. And at the International Crane Foundation, we are a nonprofit organization that's working to not only protect cranes, but the habitats that they use. So you can probably imagine that we're doing work around the world. And pictured here, I have just kind of a glimpse of the work that we're doing around the world to protect these cranes in the places that they dance. In the top left image, we have some of our staff at our headquarters, which is again in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And there they're working with a recently fledged migratory whooping crane that's out in the wild. Here in North America, and both here in the Midwest, we have two species of cranes. That's the whooping crane and the sandhill crane. The sandhill crane is one of the most common species of cranes around the world. An adventure vet that everybody here has at least maybe heard of, seen or heard of sandhill crane. On the other end of the spectrum here in the Midwest, we have the whooping crane, which is one of the rarest, most endangered species of cranes. Unfortunately for cranes, being listed as threatened or endangered is not uncommon as 10 out of the 15 species are threatened or endangered. And they face various threats really due to poaching, habitat loss, diseases, and a lot of other factors. All 15 species of cranes are dependent on wetlands to some degrees, some much more so than others. Most wetland dependent is the wattled crane. So it stands to reason if wetlands are one of the most threatened habitats around the world, these incredibly wetland dependent birds are gonna be threatened by that as well. But again, today we're just gonna focus on the Midwest cranes, the Sandhill crane and the endangered whooping crane. And first here, we have the Sandhill crane whose Latin name is Bruce canadensis. So before we dive into the history of these species, I do wanna take a moment to step back and familiarize everybody with what Sandhill cranes and whooping cranes look like and sound like, because my goal at the end of this presentation is that you can comfortably identify these birds. And first, we're going to start with what they sound like, because oftentimes you're going to hear a crane long before you see one, because their calls can carry for miles. And I have two calls here that I'm going to play uh, for our sandhill crane. And I want, when you're listening to them, to notice kind of the rattling sort of karoo karoo characteristic behind these calls. They get this rattling characteristic to their call because they have a curved trachea, so it kind of reverberates on its way out and makes this rattle. So the first call that I'm going to play for you, this is a guard call. And this is kind of the call you're often going to hear when sandhill cranes are flying during migration. And it's sort of a rattling alarm sound. So I'm going to click play on that. But Steve, do you want to unmute it real quick so everybody in the audience can hear too? Oops. Is it not going now? Yeah? 
I think that one's me. <laughs> Can everyone at home hear the guard call of the sandhill crane? No, no. Yeah. All right, give me one moment. When we share the screen, we forgot to share sound. That's all it was. All right. No, unfortunately, I haven't learned this one. All right, and our second call here is going to be the unison call. In the unison call, you're going to hear two birds calling at the same time in kind of an overlapping cacophony of sounds. So I'll play that one for you all now. Playing now. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you clicked, Mike. Okay. Try again. Sorry. Oh, yeah. All right. So this is our guard call. I hope you notice kind of the rattling characteristic behind those calls. So the sandhill crane is a four foot tall crane. As you can see from this one that's in flight, they're always gonna fly with their long neck outstretched in front of them and their long black legs trailing behind them. We can see on their head, they have a featherless red patch on the crown of their head. It's kind of a sharp, long black beak, sort of an orangish amber eye. And they have a very massive wingspan, about six feet long. And throughout their entire body and their wings, they have a sort of slate gray color or kind of a reddish brown sort of color. So oftentimes we get asked, well, what about the gray sandhill cranes? Or what about the red or brown sandhill cranes? Are these two different subspecies that exist in this area? Are we seeing breeding plumage versus non-breeding plumage? And the answer is a little bit strange. But before I move to the next slide with kind of a close-up of the feathers, I want you to notice on this one that it has gray coming about halfway down its neck. And then we start to see that sort of mottled red color. So in a close-up of sandhill crane feathers, you can see that they have kind of two of them that are mixed in there. There's some that are that very prominent slate gray color and they appear to be new and very intact. And then mixed in with that, we see some of those rusty kind of red feathers and they look a little bit more worn. We also have some sandhill cranes that show that kind of red sandhill crane on top and that sort of slate gray sandhill crane on the bottom. So when sandhill cranes are returning to the Midwest, they're coming back in the spring, they're looking for places to nest. They're coming back and they're coming to wetlands at that time when they don't have green cattail, but instead it's sort of that dead sort of brown cattail left in the marsh. And at this time, our sandhill cranes want to be able to better camouflage in that environment to increase their survival and the survival of their nest and their chick. So sandhill cranes will actually take mud from wetlands and they'll paint it all over their body. And that mud from wetlands is really rich in iron. So when the air hits it, it oxidizes or kind of rusts on their feathers and creates this sort of rusty look for them right around the breeding season. The next crane that we have here in the Midwest is the whooping crane called Bruce Americana with their Latin name. And just like with the St. Hill crane, we're gonna start by talking about what a whooping crane sounds like and then move into what they look like. And with the whooping crane, they get their name, the whooping crane, because they make a whooping sort of call. So listening to this one, I want you to notice that kind of lofty whoop that they make that's different to that rattling karoo that the sandhill cranes make. So first let's play that guard call again. This is kind of a single note alarm or a shout. And then the next call we have is a unison call and I'll play that one now. So you can notice with their calls, they have more of a whooping sort of lofty thing, whereas again, our sandhill cranes, it's a rattling karoo. So whooping cranes, they stand at five feet tall. As you guys can see from the banners in here, that's a life-size whooping crane right there. So afterwards, you can see how you measure up next to the tallest bird in North America. They have long black legs. They're completely white through their body and their long neck. They have a featherless red patch on their crown, kind of a black mustache-like mask, a bright yellow eye and a grayish yellow beak. 
When they're in flight, you can see they also fly with their long neck outstretched, their long legs trailing behind them. They have about a seven to eight foot wingspan. At the tips of their wings, they have these really prominent black wingtips. Unfortunately, because whooping cranes aren't very common on the landscape, there are some much more common species that are oftentimes mistaken for whooping cranes. We have some of those pictured here, such as the American white pelican, the snow goose, the great egret, or the great blue heron, which share some similar features with whooping cranes, but are missing some of the key features that we're looking for. Some birds that are commonly mistaken for whooping cranes, or really cranes in general, are egrets and herons, because they're also long legged long-necked birds that are found in wetlands. But one good way to tell them apart is cranes will always fly with their neck outstretched, whereas herons and egrets fly with their neck kind of in an S shape. Another bird commonly mistaken for a whooping crane is of course the sandhill crane. We like to say here that they're cousins because they live in the same area and they're very, very closely related. But again, whooping cranes are white with black wingtips. Sandhill cranes are kind of a gray or red throughout their entire body and wings. So before we move on to talking about the history of these species, I always like to pause for a moment and do just a short poll to see if anybody here has seen a whooping crane or a sandhill crane based on some of these characteristics we talked about, about what they look like and they sound like. So if you just want to raise your hand, if anybody's seen a sandhill crane. All right, looks like everyone has. Has anybody here seen a whooping crane? Most people. Awesome. That's really exciting. Is there anybody who hasn't seen a crane maybe in the chat? It doesn't look like anyone hasn't seen a crane. All right, so let's talk about the history of these species, starting first with the sandhill crane. And I call the sandhill crane a conservation success story. So in the 1940s, sandhill cranes were almost completely extirpated to the east of the Mississippi River, so much so that this scene that we're looking at now, a marsh without cranes in it became common. And at this time, Aldo Leopold believed that cranes could be completely lost from the Midwest altogether. As he wrote here in Marshland Elegy saying, the sadness discernible in some marshes arises, perhaps from their once having harbored cranes. Now they stand humbled adrift in history. So sandhill cranes were quickly removed from the Midwest landscape, ultimately due to unregulated hunting and habitat loss. And this had a really massive impact on sandhill cranes simply because of their life history. So in 1929, just before Marshland Elegy was published, Aldo Leopold estimated that there were only 25 breeding pairs of sandhill cranes left in Wisconsin, and they were completely lost from some other Midwestern states like Iowa, Indiana, and Ohio. So this unregulated hunting and this habitat loss have had a large effect on sandhill cranes because of their life history. But I wanna preface this by saying this life history is not unique to sandhill cranes. It does apply to all 15 species of cranes. So the first thing to know about cranes or sandhill cranes is they're an incredibly long lived species. In the wild, sandhill cranes have been documented living into their thirties and in captivity, they can live to be much older. At the International Crane Foundation, we once cared for a Siberian crane named Wolf who lived to be 83 years old. So on top of being an incredibly long lived species they are also very slow to reproduce. They typically only lay one to two eggs each year. They'll sit on those eggs for about 30 days. They'll hatch oftentimes just one colt, sometimes two. Then they will raise that chick through the summer. It takes about 80 days for that chick to be able to fledge. Following its first few migrations with its parent, it's then going to join a bachelor flock of other juvenile uh, sandhill cranes who are not yet at breeding age. And then once it's about three to five years old, it's then gonna find a single sandhill crane, which it's going to mate with and bond with for life, and then enter right back into that slow reproductive cycle. One to two eggs each year, typically hatching one chick, and that chick not breeding until it's about three to five years old. So animals with these sorts of life characteristics, being very long lived, slow to reach reproductive age, and laying very small clutches, they're often greatly affected by losses to their population. So you may be wondering where are sandhill cranes now because I did say they are a conservation success story. And they're a conservation success story because their numbers have rebounded amazingly. There's now an estimated 800,000 sandhill cranes all throughout North America. And they're one of the most abundant crane species in the world. East of the Mississippi where we are, there's an estimated 90,000 sandhill cranes that will visit this region. And as you can see from this map here, they have a massive range and that range is continuing to expand and push east. One of the most impressive displays of the rebound of the sandhill cranes occurs on the Platte River in Kearney, Nebraska every single spring. Here you can see over 600,000 sandhill cranes will visit this area. And the area is the self-proclaimed sandhill capital of the world, and it is one of the Earth's greatest spectacles of wildlife. So I have here just a short video that I'm going to show um, of these sandhill cranes, and if you just want to unmute it so everybody can kind of hear and see what this looks like.
All right, so today there are six subspecies of sandhill cranes. Three of them are migratory. So we have the lesser sandhill crane, the Canadian and the greater. Here in the Midwest, we see the greater sandhill crane. There's also three non-migratory populations of sandhill cranes that exist, and that's the Cuban in Cuba, the Florida in Florida, and the Mississippi in Mississippi. So as a species, sandhill cranes are not federally listed, but that doesn't mean that all populations of sandhill cranes are stable. The Cuban sandhill crane and the Mississippi sandhill crane are actually listed as endangered, and some of our crane conservation partners in the Gulf Coast area are working on a reintroduction program for Mississippi sandhill cranes that's really similar to the reintroduction program that we do for whooping cranes here in the Midwest. So again, here in the upper Midwest, we have the greater sandhill crane, which is incredibly common. And that's really due in part to its adaptability to an agricultural landscape. So sandhill cranes in this region are predominantly found on two different landscape types. They're found in wetlands or they're found in agricultural fields. And they use these landscapes because they're relatively flat and they also provide abundant food resources. So in wetlands, they'll eat things like crayfish, fish, snakes, frogs, berries, roots, tubers, really anything they can get their beak on. But then in an agricultural landscape, they'll eat things like waste grains or any sort of animal that might be using that area too, like a small mammal or invertebrates or even reptiles or amphibians that can use that space too. But having sandhill cranes on an agricultural landscape is not necessarily a win-win for everybody. And they've actually become a pest in some of these locations. So in the springtime when sandhill cranes use agricultural fields, they can pluck germinating corn seeds straight from the ground, creating a scene similar to the one that's on the screen you can see each piece of corn has been plucked straight from the ground, which is of course not advantageous for farmers. So the International Crane Foundation has worked very closely with scientists to create Avapel, which is essentially a bird repellent seed treatment. It's a taste deterrent that can be applied to corn seed before it's planted. So if St. Hill cranes pull that corn out of the ground, it tastes bad, they don't wanna continue eating in that field. It is scientifically proven to greatly reduce corn loss. And as an organization that's driven by science, it's often that we endorse to prevent crop depredation by cranes. So here in the Midwest, we've also seen that sandhill cranes have been expanding their range south. And we've noticed that through our annual Midwest crane count. So every year, the International Crane Foundation and some of our partner organizations, they get involved in the annual Midwest crane count, where we ask volunteers and citizen scientists to count all of the cranes in your community in plots that are organized by a coordinator. So if you're interested and want to learn more or get involved, you can head to our website, savingcranes.org, or you can contact the coordinator closest to you or where you live. You can also hit up Steve Becker, who knows a lot about the Midwest Crane Count and give you some more information about that too. But the date for this year's Midwest Crane Count will be Saturday, April 15th, 2023, from 5.30 to 7.30 in the morning. We've been counting for cranes in DuPage County for a few years now. Starting in 2017 and 2018, we didn't count any cranes. By 2019, they counted 10 sandhill cranes. And then by 2021, there were 42 sandhill cranes counted in DuPage County. So over the years, we've been seeing that sandhill cranes have been expanding the range. As we see on the map, it's expanding eastward, but we're also seeing that they're beginning to expand their breeding range. So their breeding range is predominantly in Wisconsin, but they're starting to expand it south into areas like Northern Illinois. So in the past two years, we've started counting more frequently for sandhill cranes in the upper stretches of the Illinois River in places like Medewin Prairie. And just this year, Medewin Prairie confirmed the first hatching of the sandhill crane colt on their property, which is incredibly exciting news. And hopefully we'll start to see more sandhill cranes hatching chicks in upper or in Northern Illinois in the coming years. And while we have good news about sandhill cranes expanding the ranges, of course, sandhill cranes are still continuing to face threats here in the Midwest and across North America. So as we said before, two populations of sandhill cranes are listed as endangered. We're also seeing that sandhill cranes in some Western states are listed as state threatened, such as in California. And we're also seeing that that non-migratory population of Florida sandhill cranes has been slowly declining over the years. Some additional threats that sandhill cranes are facing is the expansion of legal sandhill crane hunting seasons. So there's currently legal hunting for sandhill cranes in 17 states. In the eastern population that comes through this area, there's legal hunting in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama. And there's discussions for legal hunting season in Wisconsin as well. That's not something that the International Crane Foundation supports because having a legal hunting season in a breeding area for whooping cranes and sandhill cranes could have incredibly detrimental effects on the population that we don't want to find out about. Some other impacts for sandhill cranes or threats that they're facing are the threats of urban expansion and agricultural conversion, which threatens some of the wetland roosting sites that they use. So we will see that sandhill cranes will use agricultural landscapes. They'll use those during the day when they're feeding, but they're always going to need wetland roosting sites at night to return to. 
Sand Hill cranes also continue to be threatened by challenges to the Clean Water Act and the expansion of high voltage lines and wind farms, which really increase the likelihood of crane collisions and deaths. It's also important to note that all of these threats that we listed here, they're not unique to Sand Hill cranes. They apply to a lot of birds, including the endangered whooping crane that's here in the Midwest as well. Let's talk a little bit more about the whooping crane. And I call the whooping crane a story of perseverance, cooperation, and creativity, as this is a conservation effort that is still being played out on our landscape. So historically, whooping cranes would have had a massive range. As you can see from this map here, their range would have spanned all the way up to the Arctic, where they would have spent the summer months breeding, then would have migrated through the bulk of the United States, and then spent their winter months in central Mexico or coastal Gulf of Mexico area. So pre-European expansion, it was predicted that there were 10,000 whooping cranes in the fertile prairies and wetlands of North America. But by the 1940s, that number dropped to just 20 whooping cranes left in the wild. And you may be wondering what contributed to this decline of whooping cranes. And unfortunately, there were many, many factors that contributed to this decline. The first being unregulated hunting. As you can see from this hunter who is posing with a whooping crane that he has shot and has on display. And right above that, you see a sandhill crane as well. So when European settlers moved into these areas, these fertile wetlands and prairies of North America, these areas were lush with resources. But unfortunately, at this time, game laws were mostly ignored and they were rarely enforced. And this really led to unrestrained hunting and destruction of wild spaces. And it also led to the extinction of many wild species, one of which was the passenger pigeon. But as whooping cranes became more scarce on the landscape as a result of this unregulated hunting, we saw not only an increase in hunting of the species because of their increase in value, but we also saw an increase in egg collecting. And egg collecting has massive impact on whooping cranes because of the life history, which is the same as that of sandhill cranes. They're very long lived, takes a long time for them to reach reproductive age, and they don't lay very many eggs. So when we're seeing that adults are getting hunted out of the population and those that are surviving to lay eggs are getting their eggs taken off of their nest, that population starts to drop incredibly quickly. Some other uh, contributions to the decline of whooping cranes include the millinery trade and habitat loss. So the millinery trade is essentially the trade for wild bird feathers, which at this time were used to adorn women's hats for fashion. And unfortunately, some of the most sought after bird feathers were those of very large white birds that could make large white plumes. So of course, the whooping crane was very impacted by this as well. But luckily for the whooping crane and many other birds that were impacted by the millinery trade, some high society women from Boston, they noticed this issue and they formed the first Audubon Society, which was the Massachusetts Audubon Society, and it banned the trade of wild bird feathers. The final contributor to the decline of whooping cranes was habitat loss, which was largely driven by the Homestead Act of the 1860s. And this act essentially encouraged people to rapidly move out west and in doing so convert hundreds of thousands of acres of that fertile wetland and prairie habitat that whooping cranes depended on into an agricultural landscape, which took away not only a valuable resource for whooping cranes, but many other wetland dependent species. So when people began to notice not only the decline of some of those common uh, species, but also these wild spaces, it resulted in a series of laws to protect these species and spaces, the first of which was in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, essentially prohibits the illegal take of migratory birds, is an act that we still see today, protects hundreds of thousands of birds. Next, we saw the passage of the Duck Stamp Act. If you're familiar with wetlands, or you might be a waterfall hunter yourself, you may be familiar with the Duck Stamp Act. But essentially, it's a federal art competition to design these duck stamps, which are sold to hunters to hunt on federal lands. And that money is then recirculated back into conservation. The Duck Stamp Act still exists today, and it's raised over $850 million to protect 6.5 million acres of wildlife habitat. 1966, we saw the creation of the refuge system. This is incredibly important for whooping cranes because many of the whooping cranes that we uh, see today use a lot of National Wildlife Refuge land, including the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, where we see many whooping cranes spending their winter months in coastal Texas. We then saw the passage of the Clean Water Act, which is also incredibly important for helping to protect some of those aquatic habitats that animals use, including those wetlands that whooping cranes depend on. And then finally, in 1973, we saw the passage of the Endangered Species Act. At this time, whooping cranes had risen to about 70 whooping cranes left in the wild. They were listed as endangered in 1973, and they're still listed as endangered today. That's because none of the current populations of whooping cranes are self-sustaining or at the point where they're not dependent on the International Crane Foundation or some of our crane conservation partners to keep putting birds out into the population or have kind of a heavy hand in the management and monitoring of these wild populations. So today, whooping cranes exist across four distinct populations. The first of which is that historic population that once was 10,000 and dropped to 20 birds. That population is now known as the Aransas Wood Buffalo population. 
as these birds will spend their summer months at Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada and then migrate down to spend their winter months at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. In the 1990s, the International Crane Foundation and some of our crane conservation partners also worked to reintroduce a non-migratory population of whooping cranes in Florida. In 2001, they reintroduced a migratory population that would spend its summer months in Wisconsin and then migrate down to Florida in the winter. This population is known as the Eastern Migratory Population or the EMP. That's one we're really gonna focus on today is that's one that we can see here in this area. And then most recently in 2011, they worked to reintroduce a non-migratory population of whooping cranes to Louisiana. So the Eastern Migratory Population or again, the EMP is a reintroduced population of whooping cranes. And it was started when birds hatched and raised in captivity for release were then released out into the wild. So this process that we're going to talk about, it's incredibly labor intensive and it's very expensive, but it was very necessary to bring whooping cranes back to the North American landscape. And these methods that we're going to talk about, they're still being used today because again, these populations are slowly growing. Hopefully one day they will be self-sustaining, but they're not yet at that point. And there are really many steps to this process, but really for simplicity's sake, the first step that we're going to talk about is breeding these birds ultimately through artificial insemination. And artificial insemination is the method that we use because we need to increase genetic diversity of these populations to have healthy wild flocks and healthy captive flocks. So when we're talking about a population that dropped to just 20 birds left out in the wild, they essentially underwent a very severe genetic bottleneck. We also know that one great life history trait of whooping cranes and of sandhill cranes and all 15 species of cranes is they find one individual and they mate with that same bird year after year after year. But when we have a very severe genetic bottleneck and we have the same genetics getting put out year after year after year, we're not gonna see healthy flocks. So essentially birds in captivity, they maintain social partnerships where they live with the birds that they spend time with, they'll sit on eggs with and maybe raise chicks with, but that's not really the bird that they're actually breeding with. So after we do the breeding through artificial insemination, these birds then lay fertile eggs. They'll sit on them for about 30 days. They ultimately hatch. And then it's time that we raise chicks. And we raise these chicks for release, ultimately using two different methods. And the two methods that we use are parent rearing, which is what it sounds like. Adult whooping cranes raise whooping crane chicks. And then they're released out into the wild. Or we use costume rearing. And costume rearing was introduced because the International Crane Foundation started hatching and releasing more chicks in captivity, then we had adults that could raise all of those chicks. But one important thing to note while raising these chicks and why we use these costumes is that whooping crane chicks imprint. And imprinting is really a rapid learning process where a young bird learns its identity. So if we come in looking, talking, acting, sounding like a human being and trying to raise this whooping crane, they're not gonna understand that they're a whooping crane. So then when they're released out in the wild, they don't wanna spend time with other whooping cranes. And most importantly, they don't wanna breed with other whooping cranes. So these costumes, while they do look a little silly, they are necessary for making sure that these whooping cranes understand who they are and can be wonderful assets to that wild population. So pictured here, I have kind of the anatomy of these whooping crane costumes. And when you break it down, you can see it's really similar to the anatomy of a wild whooping crane. The biologists wearing these costumes, they have white covering their entire body. That's kind of like the large white body of the whooping crane. Their left arm acts as their wing. So it's tucked in most of the time, but when they pop it out, we see those prominent black wing tips. And then their right arm acts as kind of that long neck. And then at the end, they have a puppet head that has that featherless red patch on the crown, the black mustache-like mask, that yellow eye, and that sort of grayish yellow beak. It's not enough to just look like a whooping crane. The people raising these whooping cranes for release, they also need to act and sound like whooping cranes. So they spend a lot of time observing their behaviors and they'll do things like feeding the chicks with the puppet bill, or maybe preening their feathers or roosting, or really mimicking the behaviors that a wild whooping crane would do. The final thing is to sound like whooping cranes. So they can't talk while they're wearing these costumes. Instead, they have to broadcast a contact call. And this is kind of a soft purring sort of sound that an adult whooping crane would make when talking to their chick. And I have that to play for you guys right now, but I will say it is pretty quiet. So they'll make that purring call the entire time when they're working with those whooping crane chicks. And ultimately they learn their identity to be a whooping crane. This population was released in 2001 for the first release. And then we just kind of waited and hope that they understood they were whooping cranes. And the first chicks that were released were then finally able to successfully hatch and raise a chick by 2006. So we do know that this method is working, even though again, it does look a little bit ridiculous. So once these chicks are raised in captivity, either by adult whooping cranes or by costumes, it's now time for them to be released. 
And there's multiple ways that whooping cranes can be released out into the wild, but the one that's pictured here is a soft release option. And this is essentially where whooping cranes are put out in the wild wetland in a temporary pen. They're given time to acclimate to it, and over time that pen is taken apart until they're completely out in the wild. After they're out in the wild, it's then time to start monitoring these birds. So as you can see, this is very, very time intensive, but I said before, it's also expensive as well. So that entire process of breeding, raising, releasing, and monitoring just one whooping crane chick out in the wild costs about $100,000 per bird. So it's incredibly expensive, but again, it was necessary to bring whooping cranes back to the Eastern United States. So when whooping cranes are out in the wild, it's also important that we continue to monitor these populations and all of the whooping cranes that have been released into this Eastern migratory population, they're given color bands and many of them are also given a radio tag as well, which allows us to be able to track them and understand who is who. So we have a team of scientists at the International Crane Foundation, as well as volunteers along the flyway who track the whooping cranes during the summer and on their migration and during the winter months to understand the habitats they're using, the decisions they're making, the other birds they're associating with, and hopefully if they're starting to uh, mate with an individual or breed or successfully hatch and raise chicks. You can see here from these images that all these birds have a unique combination of colorful bands on their legs. And this kind of acts as their identity. We like to call it their crane jewelry. And it's like wearing a name tag on these birds. So each crane will have unique identification. And like I said, we depend on our scientists and our volunteers to track these birds. We also depend really closely on citizen scientists in the communities where whooping cranes live or in the areas that whooping cranes might be flying through. I like to say that if you are out in the wild and you're looking for birds, you're honestly more likely to run into, whooping, uh, run into the whooping cranes than we are sometimes. So yes, that if you spot whooping cranes out in the wild, you report them to the International Crane Foundation so we can learn more about the decisions these birds are making. So I have some information here about reporting a banded whooping crane. So the first step to reporting a banded whooping crane is to first confirm that you saw a whooping crane. And you can use some of those tips, tricks, and pointers I talked about at the start. Five foot tall white bird, long legs, long neck, red on its head, black mustache mask, bright yellow eye, grayish yellow beak. If it's in flight, it has its neck out and its legs out, massive wingspan with black wingtips. Next thing you can do is check if there are whooping cranes in your area. You can check that on our website. We have um, an area on our website called whoopermap.savingcranes.org. And it'll have a landing page like the one that's pictured here. And here we have the counties labeled where whooping cranes have recently been spotted. And this is updated very regularly. So you can see if whooping cranes have been spotted already in your area, or if you may be the first one to spot them during their migration. And the next we ask that you report your sighting. And you can do that by reporting a banded whooping crane from the Where the Whoopers map, or you can head to bandedcranes.org. And when reporting your sighting, we ask that you share with us the specific location you saw the whooping crane, the colorful leg band combination that you saw. If you have a photograph, that's really helpful for us too. Any sort of unique behaviors that these birds are making or if they're associating with other birds. We do ask though, if you spot whooping cranes and have that exact location information, you don't share that with your friends, family, or on social media. We do wanna maintain the privacy of the locations of these whooping cranes. They are endangered and they're very sensitive to disturbance. So we don't want people flocking out per se to go see these birds and introduce them to any unnecessary disturbance. But from citizen science recordings, we've really learned a lot about our whooping cranes. And one of the most important things we've learned is that the whooping cranes in the Eastern migratory population that were taught a migration route down to Florida, they decided they don't wanna go down as far as Florida in the winter. And we're seeing that many of them are actually stopping in Northern Alabama, at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge, or sometimes in Eastern Indiana as well. We're also seeing that they're increasingly stopping in uh, private property areas in Western Illinois too. So we do wanna start communicating with more people in Illinois as you may increasingly see whooping cranes in the future. I do wanna to say too, with these maps that you're seeing, all this information is publicly accessible on our website and it's put out through these monthly whooping crane Eastern population updates by our whooping crane biologist on the first of every month. But in 2016, we received an incredibly cool citizen science recording of crane spotted in Illinois from a Sam Burkhart and he shared this photo with us too. So in this photo, you can see, of course, the Chicago skyline and above it, a lot of birds. And here he observed in downtown Chicago, around 30,000 sandhill cranes flying over Chicago. And if you zoom into his photos, you can see that within that group, he also observed four whooping cranes flying through downtown Chicago. You can see in one of the photos, there's a lone juvenile and in another, there's two adults with a juvenile with them as well, which is incredibly exciting. And I don't think downtown Chicago is a place that you would expect to see an endangered species that almost reached extinction in the 40s. So it's pretty exciting to see. And we're also learning from citizen science reportings that 
the open cranes that are flying up from Indiana, they are kind of curving along that Chicago area, um, along the uh, lower stretch of Lake Michigan on their way back up to Wisconsin. And we're assuming that they may be flying a little bit lower in the sky in the Chicago area to kind of stay outside of the O'Hare airspace. So you might see a whooping crane in downtown Chicago, which is pretty exciting. But today, across all of the wild and captive flocks of whooping cranes, there are about 800 birds. So we can see here in captivity, there's about 136. Not all of them live at the International Crane Foundation. We have about 30 whooping cranes. That historic population that went from 10,000 down to 20 now sits at about 506 birds. Here in the Midwest, in the Eastern Migratory population, we have about 80. That uh, 2011 reintroduction in Louisiana, they have about 72. And then finally, our oldest reintroduction in the 1990s in Florida, they have only seven birds. We've ultimately stopped reintroductions in Florida because we very quickly found out that there was unstable habitat there and also a high risk of predation by bobcats. And for each whooping crane that's released in the wild costing about $100,000 per bird, that's a pretty expensive meal ticket for bobcats. So we have stopped reintroduction efforts there. But in just about 70 years, we have seen a significant recovery of the species. And this story is really proof that by working together, scientists, governments, and communities can really save a species from the brink of extinction. Our work, however, is not done. Whooping cranes, just like sandhill cranes, are continuing to face threats around the United States and here in our eastern population. And these threats are resulting in mortalities of whooping cranes, so much so that the loss of one adult whooping crane can be a major setback for this population's future growth. And some of the major threats that these birds are continuing to face are threats of power line collisions, habitat loss, freshwater diversions, and poaching. We'll just talk about two of them today that really impact this eastern population, and that's power line collisions and poaching. So we'll start first with power line collisions. A 2008 report by researchers from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Texas State University found that power line collisions are the number one known cause of mortality for recently fledged migratory whooping cranes. So because of this, crane conservation organizations have worked very closely with power companies to suggest alternative strategies that may decrease whooping crane collisions and deaths. So the first strategy is burying power lines underground in some of those key stopover areas. So not necessarily burying them underground in their entire migratory route, whooping cranes will stop over in the same areas year after year. And when they're stopping over in these areas, they're flying closer to the ground, they're much more tired, they're less alert, and that's when they're likely to collide with power lines. So you suggested burying power lines whenever possible. However, that's not always the option that people are going to go for. So you suggested an alternative strategy, and this is marking the lines with some of these highly visible, highly reflective line tags to make it so that these power lines are just a little bit more visible, so whooping cranes can better avoid them and they're not as likely to collide with them. Another unfortunate cause of whooping crane mortalities is poaching of whooping cranes. So until the late 90s, there was only one population of whooping cranes. That was that historic population pictured here in kind of a yellow. Then by the 90s, we saw the Florida population in orange, 2001, the Eastern population in gray, and in 2011, that non-migratory Louisiana population here in blue. And following the reintroduction of these populations, we unfortunately saw an increase in whooping crane deaths by gunshot. There is one thing to note though, our historic population, the Aransas wood buffalo population, not all of those birds are tagged. There's actually a uh, much smaller number of birds within that population that have those color bands or those radio tags on them. Whereas in our reintroduced population, about 100% of those birds are tagged. So there is just a higher level of monitoring within those reintroduced populations. But that does mean that there could be some deaths by gunshot or poaching within that historic population that we are just missing because we're not monitoring those birds as closely. But in the eastern migratory population, again, the birds that come through here, we've seen that shooting cases are occurring across the flyway. We've seen cases in seven states, including in some of our large stopover states for whooping cranes, which include Wisconsin, Indiana, and Alabama. So in a large majority of the shooting cases that we're seeing, they're not really tied to hunters or hunting incidents. And the few that are, the hunters are already in violation of hunting regulations, such as shooting before legal hunting hours when it makes it difficult to identify birds. And, but in that case, we would then say that that person is a poacher, as a poacher is somebody who doesn't follow hunting regulations. So ultimately, this picture here, unfortunately, represents a typical situation in where a whooping crane is shot. You can see that these birds are on private property, they're on a field, they're highly visible from the road. And oftentimes these birds are being shot from the roadside, even sometimes from inside of vehicles using high powered rifles. So this entire act is highly illegal and the person who's committing this act is a vandal, not a hunter who made an honest mistake. And one of the poaching incidents that we know about was committed by a man named Jeff G. Blatchford. 
He was a 25-year-old man in South Dakota. And in 2012, he shot an adult male whooping crane and a hawk. And when he was asked about shooting these birds, he said he did this sort of thing all the time. He admitted to shooting hawks off of power lines and shooting ducks in ditches. But he said, I have never shot an eagle. And he wasn't asked if he had shot an eagle. He, didn't, he just wanted to make sure that people knew that wasn't something that he would do. And that's really an interesting response because it tells us two things. First, he may be aware that he could get in trouble for shooting bald eagles as they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Golden and Bald Eagle Protection Act. And he's also maybe aware of the pride that his community and his country has in eagles. And he may be aware that his community may not think very highly of him if he shoots an eagle. So this pride and this awareness of penalties that exists for bald eagles and really aids in their protection doesn't necessarily exist for whooping cranes, but it could be very pivotal in increasing the protection for these birds out in the wild. So the International Crane Foundation, of course, wanted to know why, bird, or why people were shooting whooping cranes and what we could do to prevent it. So in 2015, ICF attended a workshop that used situational crime prevention to address wildlife crimes, which again, in our case, is poaching. So this theory of situational crime prevention, it essentially states that wildlife crime occurs when these three scenarios align. So first you need an attractive target or a crime victim, that's gonna be a whooping crane. Next, you need a motivated offender, that's gonna be a poacher. And then finally, you need a lack of guardianship or that lack of protection or community support that exists for bald eagles, but doesn't necessarily exist for whooping cranes. We also learned in this workshop that if you knock out just one of these factors, you can greatly reduce the likelihood that a crime will occur. And the factor that we've been targeting is this lack of guardianship for whooping cranes. We found that if a community doesn't know about or care about having whooping cranes in their landscape, then there's, a there's that lack of guardianship, they're less likely to protect them, and we don't see a decrease in those poaching cases for whooping cranes. So we've been working to decrease incidences of this crime of shooting a whooping crane, essentially by communities that support whooping cranes or communities that give a whoop about whooping cranes. And we've been ultimately doing this through an outreach program in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Alabama. Again, these are the Eastern Migratory Flyway states that see the most whooping cranes throughout the year. Most recently, we started doing outreach work in Texas for that historic wintering flock. We've also started doing outreach in Louisiana with that non-migratory flock. And then most recently in the Eastern Migratory Population, we started doing outreach in Illinois as we're seeing that whooping cranes are increasingly using this space. And for the birds that are spending their winter months here in Illinois, many of them are not on that federal or that state property. We're finding that they're using a lot of private property, which can be very risky for whooping cranes. What we found again in our outreach efforts is that we need communities that care about cranes to have communities that protect cranes to see a decrease in poaching. So with our outreach programs, we've been making meaningful connections first through K through 12 programming, college programming and community programming. And we ultimately do this because the average age of poachers is only 26 years old. So you can see from some of these photos, we have some of the uh, K through 12 programs we've been doing where we've been going into classrooms to talk to students about cranes or reaching out to students in camps or even at zoos. Another way that we're engaging with people is we're talking with outdoor recreationists, hunters, gun owners, birders, conservationists, really people who are already outside, as these are the people who are more likely to encounter whooping cranes. We want to make sure that we equip them with the best resources to make safe and smart decisions around whooping cranes, and also ask them to be our eyes and ears on the ground for reporting any sort of harassment and poaching of whooping cranes. And one of the things we've been doing to help um, people in these, in these groups, in these outdoor recreationist groups, is we've been sharing with them our large water bird ID guide. And I have a photo of that here and also some in the back for you guys to take home with you. But inside it, it helps to identify whooping cranes from sandhill cranes and other large water birds. It also has information about whooping cranes, ways to safely view cranes. It has information on where to report banded cranes and then phone numbers for reporting any sort of harassment or poaching of cranes that you may observe so you can better protect these birds out in the wild. We're also working really closely with individuals in these organizations because they are potential advocates for whooping cranes and they can be valuable partners for supporting robust legal protections of wetlands and whooping cranes for their long-term survival. And finally, we're working very closely with lawmakers to increase penalties for whooping crane shooting cases to make poaching less attractive and to hold poachers accountable. So another item that I have in the back for everybody is our I give a whoop stickers. This is something that we like to give out to everybody so you can share with your friends and family that you give a whoop about whooping cranes to build that sort of community support. So following all of that, you may be wondering what can I do to help cranes? And fortunately, there are many ways that you can help cranes here in the Midwest. We like to say that you can help cranes by being a crane hero. So the first way that you can be a crane hero is to know how to safely identify cranes and look for them on the landscape. So again, know the difference between whooping cranes and sandhill cranes. 
And when looking for them out in the wild, the first thing to remember is to always give them their space. We ask that you stay at least 200 yards or two football fields away from cranes at all times. They're very sensitive to disturbance, so you don't want to be getting very close to them. They're also incredibly big birds, so you probably don't want to get very close to them either. Another way that you can safely look for them in the landscape is to remember to stay on the trail when you're near these birds, respect private property and only park in designated parking areas. And if you spot these birds, to so please report them to bandedcranes.org. And if you want to share that with your friends, you can share the county that you saw the bird in, as that's the information that we share with the public. But again, don't share the specific location of where you saw these whooping cranes out in the wild. And if you see any sort of poaching and harassment of whooping cranes, to again, report that to local authorities. Another way that you can be a hero for cranes is to talk to your friends, your family and legislators in your state about cranes and wetlands in your area. So you can better protect these species in the spaces that they use. Another way you can get involved uh, to be a crane hero is to get involved in that Midwest crane count. Again, that's coming up in April of next year. We're hoping to see more and more cranes using Northern Illinois as the years go on. And then finally, another way that you can be a crane hero is to head to our website, savingcranes.org, where you can learn more information about whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, all 15 species of cranes, the work that we do. Um, and if you're interested, we are a membership organization, so you can explore those options as well. So I finally wanna wrap up my presentation by asking you all to come and visit us at the International Crane Foundation. We are in Baraboo, Wisconsin. On top of being an international organization that's working to protect these birds and the spaces they use at our site, we also have kind of a zoo-like facility. We're the only place on earth you can see all 15 species of cranes. We're open from May 1st through October 31st, nine to five every single day. It's an incredibly pleasant place to visit. We also have some wonderful hiking trails to do some birding of your own while you're there. And again, we are a membership organization. So while you're there, you can also explore those options as well. All right, so I wanna thank everybody again for being very flexible with all the technical difficulties and getting through this. And I'd like to open it up to any questions that you guys might have for me. So thank you. Yeah, and Zoom, you guys can type your questions in on the chat. I see there may be some coming in. I can. There's quite a few. Do you want to manage these questions and then I'll move over here? Yeah. So, have they tried that still taking an egg so that they would lay another one? Is that attempted or Yeah. No, they've used that and that's been um, pretty successful. So, we do that most frequently at Nasida National Wildlife Refuge. So, with our eastern migratory population, we started by releasing them in Nasida, and we very quickly found out that Nasida, right when the birds are nesting, is right when there's a black fly outbreak. So that can be kind of bothersome for the birds. They can't sit without being harassed by these flies. So essentially our biologists, they wait for that fly outbreak to happen. They go in, they collect the eggs off the nest that they can, give the birds a moment to kind of get off their nest, move around. The black fly outbreak is really short-lived. So once it dies down, the birds will rebreed, re-nest, lay eggs again, and hatch them in the wild. And then those eggs that we brought into captivity, we hatch and raise them too. <laughs> You know, I'm not, yeah, absolutely. The question was about, um, I think the video froze. There we go. The question was about Nasida National Wildlife Refuge introducing wolf packs into the area. Why would they do that if they know that there are nesting whooping cranes in the area too? Um, and I'm not quite sure on, you know, why they would have made that decision. Um, I do know that we haven't seen depredation by wolves for our whooping cranes. Of course, that's something we'll have to monitor closely, but it isn't something that we have seen at this point. And I can't quite speak to what the biologist's uh, reason for that decision was. Yeah. I think you're looking at genetic issues after the bottleneck of the resistant population. Are they studying them? Yeah, yeah, they are working very closely in studying the genetics of these populations. So we ultimately get different genetic assignments every single year for who's going to breed with who. And then we have genetic holdbacks. Uh, we determine genetic holdbacks as individuals who have really, really good genetics that we want to contribute to the breeding population. Of course, going up from 20 to what we have now, there's always going to be a little bit less genetic diversity than we would have naturally seen. So it takes a lot of you know, scientists that we coordinate with outside of the International Crane Foundation to kind of finagle how we can introduce diversity in any way possible, but it's gonna be lower no matter what. I'm gonna answer one of 
uh, these questions if I do have one. So the question in here is, um, what happens to your cranes during the winter months? Do they have indoor facilities? So that's a really good question. We often get asked, well, when do the birds leave? Because they see them out on exhibit. So all of them that are on exhibit at the International Crane Foundation, they live there year round. And they all have temperatures that determine, you know, when it gets this amount of degrees cold outside, this is outside of the range that they would feel in their native habitat. So this is kind of their lock-in temperature. So all birds have an outdoor yard and an indoor space, and they're given access to both typically throughout the summer. And then until it's cold enough where it's a lock-in temperature where they're inside the entire time and they have heat lamps in there and everything. They also have heaters in their water to make sure that that doesn't freeze. But yeah, they have all the accommodations they need to stay there year round. Um, there's another question in here. Is it physically possible for a whooping crane to mate with a sandhill? Given the specific human rearing, if so, why not do it? It is uh, physically possible for a whooping crane to mate with a sandhill crane. Uh, we've seen uh, hybrids of it before. I believe we call them whoop hills as kind of the combination of the names. Uh, we typically do not want sandhill cranes mating or mating with whooping cranes because it, of course, dilutes the genetics of the population. Uh, it's something that we don't like to see out in the wild. So if we see it starting to happen, we do separate those birds, hoping that they will mate with their own conspecifics. Um, for why we don't have sandhill cranes raising some of the whooping crane chicks, that's actually something we tried very early on. We call it the failed Colorado flock. So we put whooping crane eggs out on sandhill crane nests and had them hatch and raise them and very, very quickly found out that those whooping cranes wanted to spend time with sandhill cranes because they imprinted on them. And through that, we learned a crane is not just a crane. It really has to be the right species to have that right identity to imprint on. Just a question yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The question was how, uh, essentially, how did all of the birds get to the International Crane Foundation? So some of the birds that we've had there have been uh, diplomatic gifts that we've gotten. So with the crane spending time in all these different countries and migrating across different country borders, one part that we don't often think about in conservation is developing all of these partnerships with different countries so we can be able to do work in those spaces to help those birds. But a lot of the birds that we have at the International Crane Foundation, they're part of some sort of SSP. So we are an AZA organization, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So like any zoo, any of the animals that they have on their site are part of some sort of larger breeding project to create this sort of genetic bank so we can protect all species out in the wild. So we do have birds that will live there maybe for a few years, and then the coordinator will decide their genetics should be at a different zoo or vice versa. So the birds that are there are there essentially because they have valuable genetics. Most of them are hatched and raised in captivity. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Appreciate all her comments and, uh, and thank you for coming down. And uh, so we're gonna move on with our next part of our program. Uh, and I wanna check with uh, Donna, Donna Kubik, if you're out there, could you, uh, Donna was going to talk to us about the outreach program. And Donna, we have about a half an hour for that. Could you put into the comments whether you want to move forward with that at this time? I, yes. Can you hear me? I can. I can yeah. hear you. So um, my presentation on DBC outreach is a good 20 minutes. Is that too long? I'm sorry. I missed that. How long? 20 minutes, two zero minutes. Is that your minutes long? would be fine. All right. Uh, I'm going to mute myself here. And then Donna, if you uh, <clears throat> can get ready to share your screen in just a second, just a brief introduction. Um, we have here at the DuPage uh, Birding Club lots of requests from different organizations to learn about birds. We have requests from libraries, from schools, from other organi wildlife organizations. And those are all uh, brought forward through Donna and her outreach committee. And so you probably read about 
some of the activities and drummings, or maybe you see the article and don't read about it. Uh, but Donna does a wonderful job of coordinating all these different activities on behalf of DuPage Birding Club. So we asked Donna to do a presentation about the outreach efforts that she and her team of volunteers do. So with that, Donna, I'll turn it over to you and uh, take it away. So I am so happy to have the opportunity to tell everyone a bit about the DBC Outreach Program. So what does the DBC Outreach Group do? And I think that's best answered by giving you some examples of some things we've been involved with over the past couple of years. As Mike said, we receive many requests for presentations, bird walks, help with different birding programs, and the requests are from libraries, schools, scouting groups, park districts, garden clubs, conservation organizations, and more. And these programs are for both kids and for adults. But first, I'll tell you about some events we've participated in for kids. So we were asked by a, a scout leader for a group of daisies, daisies are kindergarten age Girl Scouts, to present something to the girls about birds and birding. So uh, we decided that perhaps a trip to Willowbrook would be interesting for the girls. So um, they contacted Willowbrook and they kindly offered a wildlife exhibit hike for the girls. And it was a very rainy day. And every single little girl, all nine daisies, came happily in the rain with rain boots on. Every single one, little pink rain boots, purple ones with flowers, with glitter, and they had raincoats on. And they didn't mind being in the rain at all. And just so enjoyed hearing about all of the birds at the Willowbrook Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. And this crane that you see here, I asked why the crane is at Willowbrook because all of the birds that are there have been injured in some way that they cannot be released. And I know there used to be two cranes, one passed away and there's one left. And I was told that this crane is one of those cranes that Stephanie just told us about that they tried to use the sandhill cranes to raise a, a whooping crane and it didn't work but the sandhill cranes had also been in this program for so long or perhaps were born into it. I don't quite understand that part, but they could no longer make it in nature on their own either. And that's what, why I was told that the cranes and now there's only one left there are at Willowbrook. So after the wildlife hike, um, we, the girls had lunch and we read a story called Ruby's Birds, which is about a little girl who learns about being a birder in Central Park. And then we learned about birding by eye and birding by ear by using DBC's plush toy collection. And this collection has become so useful for so many groups of, of young children. Um, they, you squeeze the bird so you can hear its sound. Um, you can look at the difference between male and female cardinals. So believe it or not, these plush toys have been really useful for, for especially really young, young kids. So as another example, the Roselle Public Library holds a morning explorers program every Monday morning for preschool and early elementary school kids. And they asked if we could present a program on birds. So there announcement read, join other kids at the library as we explore our world during this hands-on event. This week we'll explore local birds with a presentation from DuPage Birding Club, along with some bird watching activities. So we met and about 15 kids and often their mom and dad or grandparents showed up and we met in this green area right outside the library. And the first activity, what we had was to introduce the idea of magnification by looking at bird feathers through this really, really nice 
magnifier. Um, really enjoyed that. And we brought along some books about feathers that the kids enjoyed more than I would have ever predicted. They were <laughs> fighting with each other to, to look at the books and to try and guess what bird the feathers belong to because they were all these amazing colors. So that was something that pleasantly surprised me. And then we went on to give them the opportunity to experiment with a pair of DVC binoculars. Now this little area outside the library did not have a lot of birds. There were a couple robins and you could hear some finches in the background, maybe a chickadee, but they weren't readily visible. So they'd be really hard to use to, to try and view to when you're learning how to use binoculars. So we put some of these plush toys in the bushes and then suggested that the little ones try and use the binoculars to zoom in on them and get a close up view like you see on the right. And a, a nice anecdote is when, when I and Jackie who were leading this, this event, when we were helping a couple kids, the other kids took all the other birds out of the box. And when I turned around, these bushes were just filled with all of the plush toys. It was hilarious. It was, it was so cute. And I think, I think a lot of them really were able to focus the binoculars and see and zoom in on their favorite plush toy. The DVC Outreach has 12 pair of good quality binoculars to use for such events that have been extremely valuable. We have six 8x40 Bush and Alberters and six 6.5x32 Vortex Raptors. So I'm very thankful that we have those. Um, Prairie School of DuPage, another, another event we participated in, asked if DVC would help with monthly bird counts at the school. So Prairie School of DuPage is located on 42 acres of, of water orchards in open fields in Wheaton. It's a gorgeous setting, the school. Through all four seasons, Prairie School students begin every day with outdoor observations, which include bird watching, recording daily changes in the garden and the weather and in wildlife and the surroundings. And the school is, uh, it has kids from first grade through eighth grade. So it's a really diverse age range of kids. So last year, um, Andy, Jackie, Delon, Ron, Mike and I enjoyed birding with the kids once a month and we helped them identify the birds and record their observations. So the kids would divide up into groups and we'd join, one or two of us would join each group and help them. They, they really wanted to meticulously record the birds. They were very serious birders at, at Prairie School. It was really great fun. And all the kids at the school were familiar with Athena, this great horned owl that lives at their school. You can see it's quite a beautiful setting. And we've been, been invited to come back to Prairie School next year. So please contact me if you're interested in joining us. So what about some adult programs? So we have a lot of requests for presentations from many venues, many libraries, Addison, Aurora, Bellwood, Fountaindale, Itasca, Roselle, Wheaton, Woodridge, Warrenville, and from College of DuPage Natural Areas, Bloomingdale Park District, Glen Ellen Park District, Conservation Foundation, DuPage Wild Ones, Save the Prairie Foundation, DuPage Organic Club, and I've probably forgotten some. Along with many venues, they request many topics from beginning birding, attracting hummingbirds, spring birds, gardening for birds and butterflies, spring migration, how to attract birds in winter, beginning bird watching and the great backyard bird count, the wonders of bird migration, three things to help birds, perils of migration, non-native plants and animals, and problems with habitat. And we have not so many presenters. We have Dennis, John, Bob, Suleiman, Ron, Bob, Vicki, and Mike. So as since we don't have as many presenters as presentations, that means that a lot of these presenters have presented many times to many different groups. Which I'm so thankful for. So, excuse me, I'm going to move something that's blocking my screen. Um, 
So Dennis has given many talks for DBC outreach on many topics, including perils of migration, hummingbirds, attracting hummingbirds, and three things to help birds. And I love this picture of Dennis because it shows behind him the, the feeders for his favorite birds, which are everyone knows are hummingbirds. And here's a, a very nice quote from Dennis. Let me read what he says about his outreach work whether it's outreach presentations, webinars, or the YouTube education channel, the objective is the same. Birds are fascinating. They are fragile and incredibly resilient at the same time. They are a joy to behold, but they need our help to survive. One way or another, these messages are woven into every presentation. That's beautiful, thanks Dennis. John Spula has also given talks on many topics as start watching birds, spring birds, wonders of migration, hummingbirds, gardening for birds and butterflies, and our native plants. And in the images you can see on the left, you can see John giving a presentation in the middle, giving a bird walk. And on the right, you see one of many, an announcement for one of his many presentations. This one was taken as a shot of uh, the announcement from Bellwood Library that that John is going to introduce you to our local birds, the best spots to see them, how to select binoculars and related gear and much more. So this quote from, from John says, I think outreach programs are DBC's best way to not only share the joys of bird watching and to advocate for bird conservation, but to educate people about the birds and other natural wonders in their own backyards. So thank you, John. We've also had requests for beginners bird walks. Um, one request came from Morton Grove Library and we ended up um, leading a walk at Linnea Woods along the North Branch of the Chicago River and another from Fountaindale Library. And we ended up giving a walk along the lovely Lily Cash Creek in Bolingbrook. And the goals during these walks was to learn about local migratory birds, but also to we provided binoculars along with instruction on how to effectively use them to feed birds. So Jackie and I led those two walks. And as you can see, those those walks are not were not all in DuPage County. So we don't strictly limit our outreach to the DuPage County. We also had a request for consultation. We recently received this request. Can you suggest anyone who could help in identifying locations and types of birdhouses that will help attract more birds at Panfish Park? And John Sabula has volunteered to consult on the project and visited Pan Panfish Park. And he reported that it has potential and if more people birded it, it could prove to be a resource for the club, partly because it's less than five minutes away from the church where we meet and largely because if it is developed properly, it could be a good site for people with disabilities. Along those lines, it might be possible to direct feeders along the lines of uh, what Wyman Woods does, which would enhance such an activity. So thank you again to John for helping with this. We've also participated in festivals. We participated in two pollinator festivals. Last year, we participated in the festival that was led by the Dairy and Gardening Club at the Indian Prairie Public Library. And Bob Fisher represented the DuPage Birding Club at that event as, and of course he also was representing birds as pollinators. This year, we participated in the Aurora Pollinator Festival and Bob Fisher had company this year. The series is joined by Andy, Delon, Natalie, Jackie, Sirman, Sursa, and myself. So I'm going to tell you a little more about the Aurora Pollinator Festival because it's really fun and quite successful. And in spite of a very, very windy, stormy start, the inaugural, inaugural Aurora Pollinator Festival was a big success for all participants, including the DuPage Birding Club. And you can see how windy it is because you can see all of our banners just flying like crazy in the wind. Uh, we set up twin canopies. So there was one that was had more things for grownups like um, information about 
international location of different birds that are pollinators and information about the DuPage Birding Club and the other canopy at things more geared toward kids, which I'll show you in a minute. So here you see Sirman Surasak sharing information about bird pollinators of the world with visitors and offered a gift of a small salvia to the little ones that stopped by. And they distributed many DBC brochures and checklists and had a lot of questions about the birding club. And you can see on in this photo that they have many books that they're sharing on, on the table and also a map of bird pollinators around the world that we made for the festival. So this, it's, this map is really like a two foot by three foot banner and it shows that hummingbirds are in the new world and the pollinators in Africa and Southeast Asia are sunbirds and those in Australia are honey eaters and work. And those are others, there are others, but those are the main ones. And so the birds books that, that we collected for the festival were for, the, for these groups, book of sunbirds and their allies, and then books about honey eaters and book of birds of Australia, and also a book for kids called The Littlest Honey Eater, and then books about hummingbirds, including one for kids called The Little Hummingbird. And it was especially cool to emphasize that birds that are pollinators are different in different parts of the world. For example, there are no hummingbirds in Thailand, but Sermon would explain to visitors that olive-backed sunbirds were common to see in her yard in Thailand, and they're, they're pollinators in Thailand. That was especially cool. We made a banner, again, this is like a three foot by two foot banner that explains what pollination is and shows it with a picture. It shows this bird drinking nectar, inadvertently picking up some pollen and then going over to another flower and drinking more nectar and hopefully depositing pollen in it, pollinating that flower. There's a little diagram showing that. So after explaining that to the kids, um, the kids help little paper hummingbirds pollinate flowers. We had a bunch of these little paper hummingbirds and they could dip the bird's beak into the pollen, which was glitter that we put inside a flower. And then they tried to pass the glitter onto the neighboring flower. So here's a little boy who's doing that. He has one of these paper hummingbirds in his hand. He's dipping it into a flower, having this glitter stick to its beak and then trying to shake off the glitter into the neighboring flower. And the kids were welcome to take a little hummingbird home to show their friends how amazing the birds are. And using a hummingbird hat and flower cleverly designed and expertly crafted by Katherine Howard. Thank you so much, Katherine. Bob Fisher demonstrated how hummingbirds drink nectar, inspiring many little ones to experience what it's like to be a hummingbird too. So this picture shows Bob with this hummingbird hat on and this flower also made by, by Catherine. And he could move, put the hummingbird's beak into the hat and then lean back and try and get the beak out. So kids, this was hilarious. And kids really wanted to do it. And parents really wanted their kids to do it because it was a great photo op. So I had permission to take these pictures and use these pictures of these kids. And so this little boy's having fun doing it here two young girls doing the same thing. I know that it was especially cool that Bob used this experience as, as an opportunity to explain why hummingbirds need to fly backwards. Like, because you would have to physically walk backwards a bit to get your beak out of that flower. So I thought, Bob, I thought that was just a really lovely way to, to talk about how how hummingbirds fly and why they need to fly backwards. Um, and additionally, Andy, Natalie, Jackie, Dylan, and Bob amazed visitors with fun facts about hummingbirds. And they, for example, would challenge them to guess the weight of the bird. So that's really quite fun. And this is another banner that we made again with a three foot by two foot banner that discusses why birds 
pollinators are important. So hopefully everyone enjoyed learning why bird pollinators are important at the Aurora Pollinator Festival. Another project that we worked on was called, as part of Tools for Educators. So when COVID first started, we would get a lot of emails asking like parents, teachers, or scout leaders asking, how can we identify the birds in our backyard? How can I teach my Girl Scouts how to identify a bird by its sound, Think, things like that. So we would answer via email with lists of birds and send links to the Cornell website. And it was getting, it was kind of clunky. And, and we thought, well, why don't we make our own website that has all that information on it about the local birds in, in DuPage County. So to view what's, what we put together is on the Tools for Educator website. So you go to our homepage and then navigate down to learn about birds. And then there's Tools for Educators. Under Tools for Educators, the first thing is a deep dive into common birds of DuPage County. So we list the 10 most commonly seen birds as a function of season. And then for each bird, we have information about, say, information about their appearance, their sounds, and a link to the sounds, their diet, the range, habitat, behavior, such as nesting behavior, some fun anecdote about them that's from literature or prose. Can you attract the bird to a feeder? And if so, how? And the origin of their names, both the common and scientific name. So there's information like that about each, each of the birds. I'm having trouble seeing my screen because the problem. Go back to tools for educators. So there's all of the common birds of DuPage County. Uh, and another thing we developed was the nesting guide for the same common birds of DuPage County. And that's a beautiful spreadsheet with all of the common birds in, in the left-hand column, and then information about each bird. Picture of the bird, its nest, and does it nest in DuPage County? When does it nest? What is the nesting habitat? Number of broods, clutch size, incubation period, fledgling period, egg shape, egg size, egg color, egg texture, nest shape, nest size, nest location, nest composition, who builds the nest, precocial or triple, parenting, diet, and any brood parasitism. So this is, a, I think, a really nice reference for, for educators or, or for anybody. And another tool that educators could use is the DBC paint box. So, um, Dilan created these three color or paint by number birds for, for educators to use such as air pythons. We also have Birdo Bingo, and these Birdo Bingo cards are absolutely suitable for framing. Um, I would rather frame it than play Birdo Bingo because they're so beautiful. So Natalie, our president, painted all of these birds and they're just gorgeous. And there are four Birdo Bingo cards that you can um, use to play, play with your friends or with kids. And yeah. 
And there's also a link to a bird call bingo through the Park District. Also on our website under the same Learn About Birds is the outreach, the outreach program page. And on this page, you can see um, a currently um, scheduled programs and it gives you uh, a link to my email if you want to contact me, if you want to join us on some activities, or if you have some ideas for outreach, it would be extremely welcome. And we explain a little bit about you know, group presentations, outreach field trips, and outreach events. Um, our outreach group has meets via Zoom the first Monday evening of every month. And back to my presentation. And on the first Saturday of every month, we meet just informally for an outreach group bird walk. So please, please join us. That's all I have.